परफॉर्मेंस मॉनिटरिंग सो डोंट एज्यूम दैट एवरी वन अंडरस्टैंड द सेम थिंग सेम वे डेफिनेशन ऑफ टर्न ओवर फॉर ए नर्सिंग स्टाफ विल बी पीरियड फ्रॉम वेन वन पेशेंट इज आउट ऑफ द रूम अंटिल द नेक्स्ट पेशेंट इज ब्रॉट इन टू द रूम बट फॉर द सर्जन दिस इज द पीरियड फ्रॉम एंड ऑफ वन केस अंटिल एन इंसीजन इज मेड इन द नेक्स्ट केस स्टार्टिंग टाइम सेवन थर्टी मीन्स फॉर मैनी दैट इट इज वेन द पेशेंट एंटर्स इन द रूम बट फॉर द सर्जन वेन द पेशेंट इज प्रिपेयर ड्रेप्ड एंड सर्जन इज रेडी टू मेक एन इंसीजन दैट इज द स्टार्ट टाइम सो सेवन थर्टी इज द इंसीजन टाइम नॉट द पेशेंट एंट्री टाइम इन द रूम सर्जिकल बेड्स आर ऑल्सो क्रूशियल सो इन द सेम सर्जिकल बेड पेशेंट शुड बी इन द प्री ऑपरेटिव एरिया आफ्टर द वॉर्ड देन ओ आर एंड इन द पी एस यू बट इन द पी एस यू वेंस वी आर गिविंग द पोस्ट ऑपरेटिव इंस्ट्रक्शन द पेशेंट शुड बी मूव इन टू द चेयर सो दैट द ऑप्टिमल यूटिलाइजेशन ऑफ सर्जिकल बेड कैन बी डन इनकॉर्पोरेट एंड एफिशियंट डायलिटेशन प्रोटोकॉल एट मेनी प्लेसेज द कम्बाइंड डायलिटेशन ड्रॉप्स आर बींग पुट्स फॉर द क्विकर एक्शन एंड इट इज ईजी फॉर द नर्स टू डायलेट द पीपल इन वन और टू ड्रॉप्स एंड इट ऑल्सो कट द कॉस्ट यूनिवर्सल लीड्स फॉर मॉनिटरिंग द मशीन शुड बी देयर सो दैट वन शुड नॉट डिटैच एंड अटैच अगेन एंड अगेन इन द प्री ऑपरेटिव ऑपरेटिव एंड रूम एंड पी एस यू इट सेव द टाइम वाइल शिफ्टिंग द पेशेंट जस्ट यू हैव टू डिसकनेक्ट एट वन प्लेस एंड देन कनेक्टेड इन द ओ आर और पी एस यू मोस्ट ऑफ द पेशेंट्स फॉर कमिंग फॉर ऑफथेलमिक सर्जरी दे नीड ओनली सेलाइन लॉक नॉट द आई वी ड्रिप सो इट विल ऑल्सो प्रिवेंट सम टाइम practices at different places are different so one has to make it individualized in the individual practice corporate hospital and government hospital to make the or utilization effective if there are multiple ors then keep the layout in each or same it will helps in cognitive reflexes of surgical team to develop ensure standard equipment at the same place in every or it will help to reduce the stress of or staff organization of supply table is also important and it should be same training of or staff to a maximum should be done such as pre operative nurse should be trained how to position the patient in or table scrub nurse should be told how to prep and drape the patient in a particular way and after finishing the surgery surgeon can leave uh, removing of the drapes on the assistant so that he can start the next case if it is in another ot pre operative education should be started early in the pre operative setup only in the clinics or in the psc so that nurse should remind the patient for their post op instruction in the psu and psu should patient should not be hold in psu to tell about the post operative instructions and aim should be to discharge the patient in 15 minutes if they are not uh, getting any heavy sedation appropriate staff matrix should be there because each staff has to be paid by the Uh, hospital so if less than 10 cases per day it is recommended that one or is sufficient 10 to 20 2 ors and if there are 20, more than 20 cases then more than 2 ors can be uh, made to use it effectively and of course competent anesthetist is required with the trained or technicians to manage more than one or along with the necessary drugs and equipments and good quality machine and resuscitation cart they will help in a long way to to tackle the complications also and the anesthetist and the technician can evaluate the patient preoperatively in the or and after the surgery also instruments are the one of the biggest uh, problem to increase the uh, time for surgery so one should always see the need for instrument set it will depend upon the surgical time and number of ors operating simultaneously if it is an 8 minutes cataract surgery they require more set than the 12 minute surgery two or if we are managing two ors then more sets are required especially for the surgical instruments and for the anesthesia equipments also all sets should be complete it has been seen that the one one equipment is missing and the scrub nurse is going to pick the uh, particular instruments this will delay the ot time and Uh, it is worth purchasing another set if you need it repeatedly or efficiency benchmark can be seen like uh, this flow chart so in this flow chart involved patient out um, out patients are there pre surgery surgery and post surgery so one can see the constraints medical resources and human resources where is the problem which is taking more time for one patient to be coming out of the ot and in the psu and further discharge so uh, it can be split the case time into segments to have more in depth patient entry in the or to incision what are the problems during the surgery what are the problems end of the surgery to patient out what are the problems which we can uh, deal with so that means we have to assess the bottleneck patient did not arrive on time nurse don't have time to admit the patient 
waiting for instruments psu is full because of the delay in discharge so patient scheduling should be aiming to one patient in or and one ready for the marking or assess if there is one ot list should be predictable and shorter cases should be done as a first in the list if the admission uh, admission is taking 30 minutes and preparing for the procedure then early admission should be done so 7:30 time for the surgery then 7 o'clock or 6:45 patient should be in the hospital if procedure is less than 10 minutes then admit 3 to 4 patients before starting the first case so that the surgeon is not free in between and not wasting his or her time so for these scheduling of cases electronic schedule system are there and it has been shown that they radically improves or workflow there is comprehensive guide how to improve your surgery scheduling process and uh, with that you can attach it to any media mobile tab or laptop or desktop at your hospital this scheduling time view the schedule by the surgeon by the anesthetist day week or month it is a calendar and he can scroll through surgeries block time non surgical time and confirm the billing and charges along with syncing with the hospital uh, hipa compliant then nowadays iot medical devices are also there these are internet of things everybody uses web everybody uses mobile and ipad so even the patient also so end to end this is an end to end patient portal to facilitate effective communication between patient and healthcare organization it is starts from the time of appointment till the full recovery it sends reminder to the patient to make their appointment or relevant information or relevant papers to bring to the hospital it also improves the patient activation in their own care iot medical devices reduces the or delay due to limited staff because many things which a staff is doing will be done by the iot medical devices you can post the online pre and post surgical guidelines to them to the patient so that they can take care of them there will be less verbal information exchange at the time of discharge which will again uh, reduces the psu time and once a healthcare has been saved from these instructions they can be utilized for a better uh, purpose this iot medical devices have demographic data medical records lab reports consultations and it can also be used by the organization head so that he can see the doctor's utilization of allotted time is efficient or not somebody some surgeon has been allotted one and half hours but he is utilizing only one hour so that accordingly the schedule can be made for them then open communication with the staff should not be just there should be weekly team meetings to share vital information about any issue that arises ask for staff to document and communicate the problem turn feedback into actions so to conclude a hospital ot time utilization needs a competent surgeon and anesthesiologist along with the trained staff it also needs a visionary leader who can incorporate web based services to reduce the uh, personal staff work and one should learn from the experience and regular feedback should be there and they should be incorporated in the practice thank you thanks lee elaborated how to utilize the ot's effectively and efficiently moving on to the next speaker is dr pushpa from giridhar eye institute she will be talking about non operative eye swelling what are the causes and management for it i welcome dr pushpa Please Good morning, Dr. Elizabeth. Please come and take your chair. Good morning, everybody. It gives me great pleasure to be here before you, and a big thank you to the organizers of AIOC 23 for giving us this opportunity to present ourselves. So I'll go on to the matter straight away. We I'm going to talk about the non-operative swelling of the eye. I mean the non-operative cause of the swelling of the eye post surgery. What you see. and the cause and the management so if not surgery then what could be the cause or causes of the surgery 
So, like when the patient comes in for surgery, it's uh, usually local anesthesia. Majority of the surgeries in ophthalmology are under local anesthesia and uh, peribulbar block. We do talk about topical, but we are not talking about topical in this scenario. Uh, and it's not only cataract alone that we do, we do many surgeries. So, topical alone will not be... Uh, effective or useful for all the other procedures that we are going to do. So we give local anesthesia, peribulbar block, usually, and uh, about 7 to 15 ml, depending on the person who is blocking and the block, how fast you get a block, it all depends on that. So when you are injecting a volume into the peribulbar space, you can see the whole globe pushing up. That is a swelling. But then when you give a massage, it normally goes down. So why does it go down? That's because of the hyaluronidase that we add to the local anesthetic. So when we give a local anesthesia or an injecting an agent into the body, one of the main problem that you can expect is an allergic reaction to the drug that you have injected. So now you are injecting two things. You are local anesthetic with hyaluronidase. So what is hyaluronidase and why are we using it? Hyaluronidase is an enzyme that helps the spread of local anesthetic through the tissues around the eye. Uh, it comes actually from the uh, testos testicles, a bovine derivative usually, and uh, the main theory behind it is that how the sperm enters into the ovum for fertilization. That is where this hyaluronidase was first uh, detected. So now it is widely used as an additive to local anesthetic eye blocks to give more rapid onset of anesthesia and akinesia. Not just that, it just brings down what has come up with your block. It just goes down very smoothly if the highlight is there. For any local anesthetic block to work, the local anesthetic fluid needs to spread through the orbital cavity to reach the uh, relevant motor and sensory fibers. So the complex system of connective tissue membranes are just broken down and the uh, local anesthetic enters the orbital space. So you get a faster onset of block and also a uh, quiet eye. Now hyaluronidase degrades the hyaluronic acid into smaller fragments and hydrolyzes the disaccharides at hexosaminidic beta 1 to 4 linkages, that is a bit of science. And uh, that is how these connective tissue borders are broken down and the drug enters. And the maximum and a minimum effective doses are not really known. The dose can be ranged from 0.75 international units per ml to 300 international units per ml. And uh, hyaluronidase has been associated with adverse allergic reactions in a small number of cases. So the, uh, but the absence of hyaluronidase in ophthalmic regional blockade has also been associated with uh, adverse events. I have seen, you know, we give a block without hyaluronidase and it just stays like a stone there. It just doesn't go down. What has the globe that has come up because of your block will not go down. This causes local anesthesia to loculate in close proximity to the extraocular muscles and cause clinically significant myotoxicity. You can have post operative diplopia. So, and clinically important rise in intraocular pressure. You know, the lid may not open or you cannot put in the speculum during the surgery because it's very tight, the globe is tight. So, hyaluronidase with all its effects and side effects is a necessary evil. Now, as I said earlier, hyaluronidase is extracted from bovine or sheep testicles. This is probably the reason why we get allergic reaction to hyaluronidase. Human derived hyaluronidase is available in the US, but it's very expensive and it's not available here in our country. So what are the kind of allergic and anaphylactic reactions that occur? You can get a mild to severe swelling around the operated eye, out of proportion of that seen following the regular peribulbar block. Now, uh, this swelling can be uh, can appear even the next day and it can persist for a few days following the surgery. We had a patient about 18 years ago. This is how I first came, uh, uh, got this uh, information about idea of a hyaluronidase uh, allergy. This lady was, uh, she came in for her second eye six months after the first eye. I'm not knowing what happened post the first surgery. So second eye, we gave the block and she just exploded kind of. She had a massive swelling all over the face with severe rashes, itching, uh, bronchospasm and cardiac arrest. All, the whole thing happened in five minutes time. Luckily, we two anesthetists were there in the theater. Immediately, we rescued with adrenaline. We got the patient back. Then we 
re reviewed the situation and then the surgeon comes and tells me madam six months ago after the first tie she had a persistent swelling around the eye for two weeks and all the surgeons in the hospital saw the patient each day she's coming to the opd she's being called every two days and she's passed on to the next surgeon can you figure out why the swelling why the swelling and they couldn't figure out why the swelling no one told us we anesthetists never knew that such a situation was happening post surgery so <laughs> that would have been the sensitization and so when the second shot was given she just went into massive anaphylaxis now like, as i said the swelling may extend to the other eye there can be itching and rashes with hives all over the face sometimes neck rest of the body they just go scratching if you get itching you can be 100% sure it's an allergy and uh, hyalis why i'm saying hyalis is because uh, early days we used to give a test dose of xylocaine before giving the block and then when this allergy happened we knew it is not the xylocaine because xylocaine they many of them give a history of dental extraction with local anesthesia and no episode of allergy there so the only new entrant is the hyalase so that is how we zeroed down on the hyalase they can have itchiness in the throat with spasmodic cough bronchospasm and even worse tachycardia bp fall and a cardiovascular collapse so how do we manage once you identify a hyalase allergy how do you manage it intravenous antihistamines and steroids we have avil and we have hydrocortisone and the dose is like this avil we i normally give 1 ml to start with because if i give 2 ml the whole ampule at one shot they go into severe sedation and uh, hydrocortisone up to 100 to 500 mg can be given in different uh, doses uh if depending on the severity of your symptoms you can you have to give adrenaline adrenaline is the drug of choice in anaphylaxis severe anaphylaxis so this rapidly relieves the breathlessness and wheezing by relaxing the airways and also it's an inotrope stimulates the heart and increases the blood pressure continuous monitoring of vitals and keep the patient under observation according to the response to the drugs continue oral steroids and antihistamine for 3 to 5 days orally according to the initial response patients who are coming from far away uh, they discharge they go home to the probably the next district so they should always be advised to report to the nearest hospital emergency in case they have any kind of a reaction uh, once they reach home those who present with a swelling the next day in the opd please keep in mind the possibility of allergy to hyalase also it's not just the antibiotic eye drops that you're giving post op along with steroid eye drops please give antihistamine and a short course of oral steroid it will help bring down the swelling pre op history taking is very important ask for the previous history of exposure to local anesthetic with or without hyalase without hyalase is usually the dental person and uh, or any other small surgical procedure which may have been done on the patient under local anesthesia and uh, some and if you have had encountered or um, if you have encountered a hyalase allergy in your workplace please inform the patient that this patient is you are allergic to such and such a medicine and inform the next doctor that you are allergic to this drug so that this can be avoided in the next visit to whichever other doctor they are going to i mean it's it it is you should do that <clears throat> uh it and it is always prudent to give a test dose of xylocaine with hyaluronidase prior to surgery thank you ah uh. so can you use a mic please <coughs> the hyaluronidase what you have told hmm. Uh, the other one which is available is it the human or the vegetative hyaluronidase because no, i we have our usual common brand is this bovine derivative no is there but because in uh, uh, 10 years back uh, i attended one conference in us where they were highly marketing this hyaluronidase which is uh, which will not be uh, but it is not in human it is a vegetative hyaluronidase okay. from the you you are you are shown still how? not come it hasn't come here they are talking about even in references i am getting human derivative but it is not come here at all okay. so i don't not much of information on that thank you dr pushpa for the enlightening section and now call on dr jay chandran for uh, talking about simulators in ophthalmic anesthesia
good morning all so today i'm going to talk about uh, the first of its kind the simulators in regional ophthalmic anesthesia where were we as you all know in healthcare we have simulation for endotracheal tube intubation for doing basic life support for starting central line peripheral venous cannulation and even for cataract surgical steps we do have the healthcare simulation but for ophthalmic regional anesthesia this is the first of its kind which we have developed first we developed in 2015 a simulator named ophthalmic anesthesia simulation system called oasis in this the simulator objectively grades the participants who whosoever blocks the mannequin but then later on we got we got some interesting feedbacks from the participants one is that inability to view the ocular structures and the needle track pathway and the second information which we got is whether the visual feedback about the free space that is available within the orbit and also whether the angulation depth of the needle inserted shown can enhance the training experience based on this what we did was we placed two cameras one at the infrolateral wall and other at the medial wall in the mannequin and hereby we are able to see the needle track also this is the lateral view and here we can see the needle very clearly this is from the lateral view and you can also observe that globe optic nerve and the extraocular muscles this is the medial view and once again we can clearly appreciate the needle here just between the orbital medial orbital wall and the globe now before going into the detail about the simulator just wanted to briefly update you all about the recent update in regional ophthalmic anesthesia that is the traditionally the block says you should enter at the medial 2/3 and lateral 1/3 and then the supplementary block should be at the superior medial quadrant but half late what is the safest site for performing this regional block they say is extreme infrolateral corner that is just above the lateral wall and the floor you should enter the orbit rather than the medial 2/3 and 1/3 junction the reason is you can hit the extraocular muscles thereby resulting in muscle injury and myotoxicity later on the other safe site for performing the supplementary block is medial peribulbar why not superior medial the reason is the space available is the least there most vascular and many globe perforations can occur so the safest site is medial peribulbar block that can be the supplementary injection now keeping this in mind we did a survey that got published recently and in this survey we circulated a 10 item questionnaire where we found, want to know what is the preference site of blocking the patients what was this uh, preference for the supplementary injection what is the size of the needle they used and how did they learn the regional ophthalmic anesthesia so we just supplemented this 10 questionnaire and nearly 145 trainees participated in it and experience varied from minimum of 2 years to 7 years as you can see around 93% of them still tend to follow the traditional way of blocking the patients and around 52 to 89% have not performed the medial and septinons blocks respectively so these are all some of the results and many of them seem to doesn't know the size of the needle also what they are using for performing the blocks and type of the bevel whether it is a sharp end or a blunt one and the most scary thing is about nearly 85% of them still tend to follow the superior medial block as the supplementary injection and another interesting information which we got was how they learned the performing the blocks as you can see many of them were just observing the seniors and then they learned the blocks one and many of them were reading books some of them by attending conferences and lectures unfortunately there are no simulators to practice on this regional anesthesia so finally we concluded that present study shows that trainees still follow traditional way of block and the current teaching needs an immediate change involve hands on practice session on simulators and animal models now with this as a background knowledge we developed this real time view mannequin where we can see the participants performing the blocks in the simulators and at the same time they can also view the system how they perform the blocks the needle track everything we can teach the participants now some of the technical highlights how we made this simulator the globe with the extraocular muscles in the orbits 
which mimics the normal globe orbit relations was 3D designed and printed as you can see in this picture. Then the rubber which was used for the phase one was the mannequin facial features or molded using a special type of rubber called OMO30. Then two high end uh, definition cameras were placed as I was mentioning one at the inferolateral wall and other at the medial wall to show the needle track. Other special features are it provides a human analog replica of the normal globe, extraocular muscles, optic nerve, intraorbital space and orbital walls which helps the participants to learn the anatomy as well. It also provides the ability to visualize the needle track pathway and also ability to see the angulation and how much the needle can be inserted into the orbital space. And finally, it has an inert video screen recorder also, which helps the participants to go through back and correct the techniques accordingly if they had, had made any mistakes. Now, there were some limitations. One, we made only normal human globe and ob uh, orbit relations. We are not mimicked an abnormal globe orbit like deep set eyes or forward set globes or myopic eyes. So future, we are trying to integrate this abnormal globe orbit relation conditions and also we will try to simulate major vessels which were lacking in this simulator like ophthalmic artery and venous plexus also in this mannequin. To conclude with this needle, this uh, needle simulator, this type of training system by providing visual as well as physical feedback is novel in ophthalmic anesthesia training, can be utilized as a teaching module and it can enable many to train them to administer a safe regional anesthesia in their patients. Now the second simulator which we developed was the Subtinon simulator. This was a real challenge for us because unlike needle block here, the participants has to make a nick in the simulator. So it is a little bit invasive. So this was a real challenge for us, but uh, fortunately we were able to do it. As you all know, the Subtinon is gaining popularity now and they say it is safer but still there are some major complications can occur as I was mentioning here. It can result in orbital and retrobulbar hemorrhage, globe perf and central spread of local anesthetics is also required. It requires a thorough knowledge, practical skills and anatomically accurate training and evaluation system is needed. Unfortunately, there was no training system available so far for practicing Subtinon's block. With this as a background knowledge, we developed this mannequin for practicing Subtinon's block. Some of the special features are, totally we made four parts. One is mimicking the eyeball, the other mimicking the tenons and the conjunctival membrane, and the third one was the optic nerve. These are all prepared using platinum cure silicon based rubber. It's a special kind of rubber, which anatomically accurated eyeball with replaceable conjunctive and tenons membrane were made. Now once these were made around the eyeball, the tenons and the conjunctiva were wrapped up and then at the other end we just tied the rubber band and then optic nerve is then fixed behind. Then we made a specially designed high holder where we kept that eyeball in it. The advantage is that once as we can see here in the side, once if the participants has made any dissection, we can rotate the eyeball so that the undissected part can be used for performing the second and subsequent injections. Like this, a single membrane can be used for performing about five to six blocks in it. Okay, So that is one of the advantage with this high holder. We are able to rotate the eyeball easily. Now other uh, man this simulator can perform is that it can detect the quadrant of entry in which quadrant they the delegates enter, it can uh, detect. This is by the technique of magnetic sensors where we have placed as a magnet. Unfortunately, this is work ugly. This is not working. Pointer. Pointer is not working. We have placed a magnet here in the syringe and the magnetic sensors is placed at the... Yeah, thank you. So here, here we have placed a magnet, okay, at the syringe and the magnetic sensors are placed at the here at the high holder magnetic sensor so in this way we are able to see in which quadrant the delegates are entering whether they are entering into the superior medial or the inferolateral etc also this simulator can detect the plane of entry whether they are entering into the wrong plane that is a subconjunctival plane or into the correct plane that is the subtenons if they are entering into the correct plane that is sub Subtenons, then a green light will come as I will show a small video here. Here they are making a nick, okay? 
using the conjunctive. This is done in the IIT lab, so that is why the surrounding is full of electrical equipments. And this is not an hospital setting. So you can see the green light is glowing because if they are in the correct plane. This is by the mechanism called as capacitive touch sensing method. Can you just meet it? Just two more minutes. So the eyeball is made conductive by mixing copper chopped fibers in that eyeball. And if the cannula is in the subconjunctival plane, what will happen is that the cannula will not come into contact with the eyeball, which is conductive. Hence, what will happen? Red light will glow. Whereas, if it is in this correct plane, what happens? The cannula touches the eyeball or very near to the eyeball, then it is being a conductive. What happens? The green light glows. This is how the mechanism we kept it as. So we then compared this with the traditional way of learning that subtenance block. As of now, we are learning with the help of goats or pig's eye. So we did a small comparative study, which was best, and uh, we divided into two groups. And we found that most of them were preferring our human simul this simulator. The reason is ease of usage, warning systems was there, no bio waste, and it is repeatability. As you can see, animal model, that is the goat side, does not offer facial anatomy needs a qualified instructor, it needs time for replacement, it needs the things to be disposed of properly, the goat's eye I mean, needs gloves, aprons, etc., hand washing facilities, whereas our simulator model, it provides training environment closer to the clinical setting, shorter time for the replacement of the eyeballs. The eyeballs need to be actually replaced with the membranes and it requires shorter time only. But there were some limitations. One, vessels were not replicated, membranes need to be replaced after four to five pricks. In future, we are trying to have some abnormal conditions also, myopic eyes and staphylomas. And this will definitely help to learn and practice safe orbital regional anesthesia. Can give a hands-on practice session also, train the paramedics to administer blocks to learn and teach anatomy. To conclude, this is an effective anatomic analog for learning subtenance block. These are all some of the publications we made. This is the one which we did for the evaluation of the needle blocks. And this is one publication in, for evaluation of the subtenance block. And these are all some of the workshops which we conducted with for the delegates. Just want to make a small announcement that there will be 7th and 8th of October, we are having Association of Indian Ophthalmic Anesthesiologists National Meet at the Hyderabad. Center for Site will be organizing. I welcome you all for the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. J. <clears throat> and I think uh, take this occasion to really congratulate you for the hard work you've put. <laughs> like, to collaborate with the IIT, so much of effort has been put. And I hope this will be available soon for all institutes. And the next section, I invite Dr. Venkit Raja uh, for systemic emergencies in an ophthalmic setup. Good morning to all of you. Uh, let me first of all thank the organizers, ophthalmic organizers and our anesthesia organizers who have given us me the opportunity to present this systemic emergencies in ophthalmic setup. I work at LV Prasad Eye Institute uh, in Hyderabad city and uh, we also visit many of the secondary centers uh, which, is lo which are in, uh, associated with LV Prasad Eye Institute. And in many of the places, we have seen that there are a lot of systemic emergencies that arise during the ophthalmic procedures. So to overview, uh, we can place them in a pre-operative uh, model, pre-operative and perioperative emergencies in ophthalmology and how you have, you have to manage. In the, to make it in parts, the first uh, uh, systemic emergency, what I wanted to focus was anaphylaxis, which uh, Pushpa Madam has already very nicely enlightened. It is mild, moderate, and severe. The mild one is when you give the block in that area, you may uh, have a rash, and the moderate is the rash is throughout the body, and the severe one is apart from the uh, rash, what you get uh, throughout the body, you may have laryngeal spasm and all. 
and for mild it goes off with avil and uh, for moderate normally we use what you call it as uh, hydrocortisone along with uh, antihistamines and uh, and also salbutamol inhalation can nebulization can be done but for severe form adrenaline has to be used as she has mentioned normally uh, the dose what to, we prefer to give is 0.3 milligrams one in 1000 that is one milligram has 1000 micrograms um, where we give im and uh, at a uh, end stage where it is not able to manage we have to give a muscle relaxant and uh, intubate the patient and airway management has to be done vasovagal uh, attack is one of the um, emergencies what we come across uh, and uh, this is normally with the trabismus uh, screen surgeons whenever they are doing some surgery not only with that with other uh, other procedures also we will have this vasovagal attack and uh, whenever you have that the first thing is to we have to make the surgeon uh, stop the surgeon to pull the muzzle and later you can uh, uh, if you want you can try the medications uh, uh, atropine uh, and uh, glycopilate and all hypertension so this is the emergency what we are facing in our institute maybe this may be the uh, same in all the normal value i uh, i don't know if this is the parameters what every institute take we at lvp we take a cutoff uh, value as 160 by 90 and uh, who statistics show that the number of attributed risk factors for death perioperatively throughout the world is because of the perioperative uh, hypertension that come across and um, usually this lasts for two to six hours required rapid intervention results in systemic uh, vasoconstriction here i just have put something like a case scenario six because this is the scenario which happens regularly in our institute a 67 year old lady posted for retinal surgery hypertensive diabetic on treatment missed the morning dose of antihypertensive drug Preoperatively, BP shows 164 by 92, 92, which is a little bit on the higher stage, but still the surgeon wanted to do the surgery. A peribulbar block was given, and during the procedure, developed sudden onset of breathlessness. Um, so, when such type of scenarios come, how we have to manage is immediately uh, preoperative, uh, immediately the patient has to be put in a comfortable position with oxygen, and then uh, antihypertensives like uh, levitalol or nitroglycerin can be used and if this hypertension persists and the patient lands up in pulmonary edema lasix has to be used always remember that nitroglycerin is a better option than nitroprusside because nitroglycerin is a vasodilator uh, venodilator where the blood pressure will be uh, falling slowly but if uh, if at all if any anesthesia is there, you can also use a, a nitroprusside. But the difficulty with nitroprusside is it is a veno and arterial dilator, and the blood pressure falls in such a drastic way by the time you turn, the BP will be shot down. So better you stop at nitroglycerin. Most of the time, labetalol is the good drug of choice. So this type of and we come across many of the patients of this type where they land up in pulmonary edema, where uh, we have to use all this medication and apart from that CPAP. CPAP continuous positive airway pressure. It is not a mandatory that CPAP machine should be there. The, it's nothing but continuous positive airway pressure. You can put a tight mask with high flow oxygen of 15 liters will also be uh, appropriate in this type of patients. I don't want to talk much about the peribulbar block as how they come. Now the second the most important thing what I wanted to talk about uh, uh, cardiac arrest many of many of us still the ophthalmologists they feel that there is not it is not their domain but I request all uh, doctors ophthalmologists everybody should know how to do at least the basic life support whenever a patient goes into cardiac arrest I just have created a case scenario a 55 year old gentleman was given a peribulbar block in the pre-operative room and after 15 minutes when they wanted to shift the patient to theater the patient did not respond how what you do first of all assess the response and then you uh, call for help and then check the pulse so call for help is one individual may not be able to do all the things and if it suppose this goes for a very long time 
he, he may become fatigued. So that is the reason I always call for help. Two people will be definitely better than one person. And check the carotids. Um, that too for, um, uh, you should not take more than 10 seconds to check the carotids. And chest compression has to be done in the local, lower half of the sternum. That is 100 to 120 compressions per minute. And 30, for every 30 compressions, two breaths have to be given. 30 compressions, two breaths, 30 compressions, two breaths, 30 compressions, two breaths, 30 compressions, two breaths, 30 compressions, two breaths. These are five cycles. And this make one round, which should be done in two minutes. This basic thing will save the life of the individual at that particular time, because that is a patient has gone into arrest in front of you. He is a, it is a witnessed arrest. If it is delayed for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, the hopes are less. But if it is done within two to three minutes, because every one minute, ten percent of the survival will come down. So immediately, if you do chest compression and give two breaths, then for five cycles, after two minutes, again you can check the pulse and see whether the patient has come out or not. Always call for help. Whenever you are calling for help, you call, ask them to bring a crush cart. Crush cart is nothing but all the emergency drugs with a defibrillator and a monitor and an oxygen cylinder at the back. It's in some emergency room which comes on a wheels to the, uh, which can be dragged to the site of the patient. So whenever you are giving breaths, we as anesthetists, we say that if you, it need not be that you should try to intubate all the patients. In an unconscious patient also, in an unconscious patient also, if you give good back mask ventilation, you are almost 85% to 90% equivalent to what you are doing when you are doing endotracheal intubation. Of course, uh, aspiration cannot be prevented with this bag mask ventilation, but a good bag mask ventilation is almost equal to endotracheal tube intubation. And bag mask ventilation, any lay person can also learn. And whenever you are, um, you, whenever you are calling for help, you have to ask for a crush cut, defibrillator, or at least an AED. The reason why we want to want a AED is whenever a patient goes into cardiac arrest, there are four rhythms. Two are shockable and two are non-shockable. The non-shockable rhythms are asystole and pulseless electrical activity. The shockable rhythms are ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia without pulse. And it is seen that 75% of the time, the patient when he is in cardiac arrest, it is a ventricular fibrillation. That is the reason why how does the, for example, cardiac arrest, now the impulse will generate it from SA node to the AV node. If that impulse stops and even the ventricles are not contracting, you get a flat line that is asystole. For that, chest compression is good. It will help to revive the patient. But suppose the impulse is not generated, but the ventricles are not quiet. They will be beating abnormally. That is also not good because the blood is not filled into the heart and it's some, nothing is pumped out. So for that, when you deliver shock, what happens is the fibrillating ventricles will calm, calm down and again the esonate will dominate and again the impulse, the electrical impulse will start generating. That is the reason of shocking the patient. So for because of that reason, what, what has been done is defibrillator, a lay person, he cannot know what is the ECG, what is the AC story. So they have come out and developed uh, equipment like uh, what you call it as AED, Automatic External Defibrillator. That is a, just a pads which can be kept on the chest, switch on the machine, the machine will take care of. It will slow, it will inform you whether a shock is required or not. If the shock is required, just press the button. A security person is there, he will not be able to identify the ECG rhythms. So for that person, this AED will be very useful. He will be able to save the life of the patient by delivering shock. Just attach the pads, switch on the machine, attach the pads. The, the pads, they will analyze the rhythm, whether it is shockable, that is whether it is ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, or non-shockable, whether it is asystole. If it is a asystole, the machine itself will tell that continue chest compression. Shock not required. If it is a shockable, if it is a ventricular fibrillation, the machine says that shock required, kindly press the orange button. So it is, it is a very useful device and it's not that costly also. It may be 
50 to 60 uh, thousand rupees now available in the market and now the Indian versions are also coming with very cheap for 20 to 25 thousand because every small hospital if they have that they can save the life of the patient when if the patient is having a, a shockable rhythm so these are some of just the photographs of uh, what is a shockable rhythm and uh, and always the machines what you have defibrillators are all 200 joules biphasic biphasic is nothing but the shock is delivered in two directions previous machines were all monophasic the shock was delivered in one direction and in that it, the joules will be 360 joules but what happened is it was noticed that when so much of high energy is there there is a damage of the skin and all so they have come out from 360 joules to 200 joule biphasic where you can deliver the shock with less joules and biphasic all the machines which are there now defibrillator machines are 200 joules and another thing is the good thing what they are doing is all the defibrillator machines they are also keeping a AED mode in that defibrillator suppose a person is there he doesn't know the ECG read ECG he can put it on the AED mode put the pads and he can also give the shock with this particular defibrillator and uh, pharmacological management adrenaline and amiodarone is the pharmacological management of this RS patient Adrenaline can be given in shockable and non-shockable rhythm, but um, amiodarone is only given in uh, shockable rhythms. The take-home message is, before going to this, I always tell our ophthalmologist, I don't know, uh, ophthalmologists may be there, they may be feeling bad. Always tell the ophthalmologist that whenever they are taking a case, especially in the secondary centers where there is no, uh, not much manpower, they are alone, only one doctor is there, one ophthalmologist, one anesthetist is there, one ophthalmologist is there, to take, if they have good setup and everything is there, physician is there, everything is there, anesthetic machine is there, everything is, is okay. But if not, take ASA grade 1 and grade 2. ASA grade 1 is a patient with, normal patient with no comorbidities, nothing is there, patient is normal, BP is normal, is not a hypertensive, uh, not in a diabetic and all. For them, it is, for us, it is graded as ASA grade 1. Grade 2 is the patient is having hypertension and diabetic, but he is under control. He is taking the daily medication and his BP and everything is under control. His diabetic status is also under control. These two type of patients you can take. But if the patient is having a hypertension which is not controlled on the day of surgery and diabetic which is not controlled, that will come under ASA grade 3. It is better to take it in a uh, institute where you have a full full fledged things if suppose the patient goes into some um, some uh, cardiac arrest and all they should be able to manage and another thing what i want to tell you about the monitors first option is every patient if you can keep the basic three para monitors pulse oximeter which gives the saturation we call it as a multi-para monitor, everybody calls it a multi-para monitor, we, SpO2 which gives the saturation and automatically by default you will get the heart rate and NIBP, BP can be measured and also ECG. If these three parameters are there, I feel that even a ASA grade 1 patient should also be have this monitor so that if something go, be, you drape the patient and something goes wrong, it will be immediately visible onto the, uh, to us when um, on the monitor so these three para monitors for me it is only three para monitors spo2 ecg and nibp has to be for every uh, every patient asa grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 the asa grade 3 patients apart from this i always uh, request our ophthalmologist to put a cannula and do the surgery because if at all that grade 3 patient, if it lands up in problem, it will be very difficult at that particular time. The, uh, they may be, he may be in collapse and the veins are not uh, identified properly. So it may be very difficult to get the vein and we have to shoot adrenaline or some drug to that. So uh, that is the thing what uh, I always um, uh, give as a takeaway message. And apart from that, crush cart, you have to have a crush cart which is having all the emergency drugs with the defibrillator or at least AED with oxygen cylinder, bag mask, ventilation, mask, everything has to be there. Of course, IV. Nowadays, IV for IV, 
Nowadays, we are getting IV lights, where the visual, especially for children, where you can visualize the thing and put a IV cannula. And always have, how small may be the um, hospital, always have a code blue team, mega code. That is, whenever there is a code blue, who has to, a strong person will be good to do a chest compression. So who is to be doing a chest compression when is, whenever a patient goes into arrest? Normally, the code blue team consists of six, but six is a very luxury. One is for chest compression, another is for airway, third is for attaching the monitor and get delivering shock, fourth is for putting a cannula and giving the medication, fifth is the team leader, and the sixth is the person who documents what is going on. Normally, it is six uh, people, but at least three people have to be there. At least three people have to be one for airway, one for uh, chest compression, and one for attaching the monitor and all. So that is the code blue team, what we have, what we maintain in all, all almost even small institute also. And everything what in our in our country, uh, what we see is we do very good things or we do bad things, but we don't document. Documentation is very important. Once you document, we know how it's going on. So documentation has to be done for every uh, thing so that a patient safety committee and all has to be formed in the hospital. So these are the things I wanted to just mention in my lecture. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Venkatraja. That was a very vast topic, but you have nicely condensed it in such a short time, highlighting all the important points. And now I think the session is open for discussion. We are, I'm talking about the technical marketing. Who is, what is the name of the machine? Who is marketing it? What is the cost? Or where we can get it? Uh, you have every company has, sir. Philips has. Philips. Uh, Philips has. Uh, G has any. Every company has. Zoll has. Zoll are the king of the defibrillators. Zoll. Zoll has every every vendor who are supplying the defibrillators. They also supply the okay. AED. And but nowadays, apart in the defibrillator. I told you they are also keeping the AED mode because it may be used by a skilled man who knows everything about ECG, okay. used by a person who doesn't know anything about the ECG. So AED mode is also there in the defibrillator also. The two in one, two in one. Pardon? Two in one. The two in one. Yeah, two in one. Two, that is it, not two in one, three in one because monitor is also there. <laughs> the monitor is also there. You can see the monitor, attach the pulse oximeter, multi monitor that is uh, NIPP, everything is there and then AED is also there. There are two pads. Small pedal. No, yeah. Normally, in the Western countries, uh, these AEDs are placed everywhere. Like, uh, here also is there airports. If you see here, metro stations, I am not sure, but uh, airports have that AEDs. We have seen it. We have seen the airports. Some Indian companies are also making so those cheaper, cheaper. Because of this rate, this is 60,000 rupees. 60,000 is for some. That's also not very costly for human life. The earlier the shock, the better. A handpiece costs three, four, and three lakhs, but sixty thousand rupees. I think I should be mandatory. You should keep it. Actually, the government should make it. It's a mandatory. Even by the government also is mandatory. But all hospitals will not may not be able to afford and keep that AED. We have tried in. I uh, also work with uh, this 108 organization. Um, so we also kept tried to keep in the malls and all. But our Indian attitude is, within two days we saw that uh, that AED is missing in the mall. So it's it's that those things are also to be taken into consideration. Bus stops, uh, parks where elderly people go for walking for long. Th in those areas, it has to be there, busy areas. Yeah. yeah. Most of the time, the, uh, the attender of the patient will be.
portable, you can just bring it from the old man. Philips is under the Philips. Yeah, it's not just Philips, sir. Every is I am telling yeah, Zol. Many yeah, companies yeah. have uh, Neon Codon, Philips, uh, GE. Everybody has a every company has a but only thing is cost may be something beside us. Sir. Or Abhi Amare Pas Kyawa Bolato, we operate in different states. Uh, Telangana ke Siva, I am in Hyderabad. Apart from that, Gujarat. So, what we are doing is the voice prompt, what the AED does, we are converting it to the regional language. For example, if it is used, because many people, if it is in English, may not be able to understand. So, in Gujarat, Gujarati, Tamil Nadu, Tamil, Kerala, that every time, everywhere we are trying to. Thank you very much. finance part to, to, to do this research and to make the simulator no you are money, asking about money. the future future no 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 ah. if somebody want to start making something simulator simulator okay not not your thing it will be get patented but other things so how to start and from where the money is coming so for me fortunately iit sponsored the whole project okay. to be honest i was just giving them the inputs so for me, that grant was there, that uh, Department of Biotechnology, I think so. So you proposed that and then they yeah. made a protocol. Yeah, you should and write a proposal can... and submit to the Department of Biotechnology is there. Even ICMR grant is also there. So you have to submit through our Institutional Ethics Committee. Once approved, you can submit and then automatically they will see okay. that and grant can be given. Okay. It's a long run, actually 14 years. 14 years. 2009, <laughs> I started. This is where we... <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think we have... Any other questions? Yeah, please. Do you have any cut-off point for a diabetes? Because the diabetic patient, they say that they are like yeah. they, they are something normal. And when you, when you tell surgery, they immediately tell that my sugar, my sugar is sugar. Because diabetes, definitely they'll be having co-marbitis in their hypertension. What we do is, we normally... I don't know. 200 is a cutoff. Even if it is a little more, and the HB1AC is within normal limits, we, we ask them to do it. That, is, that depends again on the surgeon because he should be bothered more than us. We don't have any problem in giving the block or whatever it is. He should be worried, more worried about it. And any idea for intracameral adrenaline? Intracameral adrenaline? Yeah. Uh, Jay, what do you do? Atropin plus, I think uh, yeah. that finally we are actually we tell.
handing it one year i am changing drugs Again and again, when we say no pupil dilatation. <laughs> Thank you. 